Hello and welcome to the Capitol Report on NTD Television. I'm Steve Lance. Title 42 ending last night and the effects already being felt across the southern border. NTD's Jason Perry reports from us from the El Paso sector at the border. I'm here in El Paso, Texas, next to gate number 42. And as far as I can see, I can't really see any illegal immigrants now. But if you take a look at this video, there was a large group of immigrants who turned themselves in earlier today. As of Friday afternoon, about 23,400 immigrants were in Border Patrol custody, which is slightly lower than earlier in the week, according to a Homeland Security official. Many of those who turn themselves in here at El Paso go to Sacred Heart Church before they move on to their final destinations. We visited there earlier today and I talked with a volunteer at the church. A real mess. A lot of, well, you know, immigrants everywhere. We couldn't get in here or anything. It was awful. Because it was, all, well, it was real sad to see them here because they didn't have anywhere to go. They were trying to, you know, and the mayor of El Paso says although he didn't see any big numbers of illegal immigrants coming through El Paso on Friday, he's actually preparing for the unknown. Because we don't know what's going to happen next week and continue to happen day in and day out. We, um, we are continuing to work really close with the Border Patrol. We're continuing to work really close with Customs and Protection, ICE, and all organizations in El Paso. We've... Uh, we actually have had a very smooth transition as Title 42 has lapsed and we've gone to Title 8. Uh, and that really because we had a lot of preparation. We were ready. We were prepared. But on the other hand, tens of thousands of migrants are gathered in northern Mexico and will likely be making their way to America's southern border soon. And two South Texas counties on the Mexican border declared emergencies shortly before Title 42 was lifted. That can free up state and federal resources to help them deal with the surge of illegal immigration. And the flow of illegal immigration may not be as smooth as expected. On Thursday night, a federal judge temporarily blocked the Biden administration from releasing illegal immigrants from the Border Patrol without court notices. Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas says that could cause overcrowding at the processing facilities. That's all we have for now. Former New York prosecutor Mark Pomerantz testifying before the House Judiciary Committee earlier today over the Manhattan District Attorney's probe of former President Trump. Pomerantz used to be a New York County Special Assistant District Attorney when he was involved in the Trump investigation. The Trump Organization mislabeled hush money payments it made before the 2016 election. The former president is charged with 34 felony counts of falsifying business records to which he has pleaded not guilty. House Republicans characterized the case as being politically motivated and have been seeking information from Pomerantz. The deposition today follows a legal battle over his subpoena. Nonprofit hospitals profiting from the COVID-19 pandemic. Government watchdog group Open the Books recently released a report detailing just how far. The CEO and founder of the group, Adam Andrzejewski, joins us now to discuss. Adam Andrzejewski, thank you so much for joining us. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me back. Of course, Adam, your organization, OpenTheBooks.com, has just released another com compelling report about how nonprofit hospitals and their CEOs benefited uh, tremendously financially uh, during the pandemic. What can you tell us about this? So we found that the top 20 largest nonprofit hospitals and their CEOs, they profited to the tune of $124 billion during the pandemic. So their net worth, this is on a net asset basis. So on a net net basis, after their revenues subtract the expenses, factor in their investment gains, their net assets jumped from 2018 at 200 billion to 2021 to 324 billion dollars. During this period, they pocketed 23 billion dollars worth of COVID aid from Congress. Their CEOs made up to 17 million dollars in a single year. For example, the CEO of an Ascension Healthcare made $22 million over a three-year period, and the high watermark on a single year was $13 million worth of cash compensation. Wow, Adam, that's incredible. I mean, besides the obvious factors, what do you think contributed to this type of, uh, you know, profiteering, if you will, 
and how widespread is it? Is it a Washington problem? What, what is the root cause here? Well, I think this is an indictment of the healthcare system. For example, the life expectancy in America has dipped, dropped by 2.5 years since the pandemic. Now, in other comparable countries, during COVID, life expectancy did drop, but it has recovered. In the United States, it hasn't recovered. Here's the other indictment of the healthcare system. You know, these top 20 nonprofits, basic, only one of them is fully in compliance with the federal healthcare price transparency rules. So they're continuing to play a game of baseball with the patient as the batter blindfolded. They're not showing them the prices while they run up the score at will and running up the score they are to the tune of $124 billion of pandemic profiteering. And just to be clear, Adam, this is not a partisan issue. We've seen Republicans and Democrats speaking out about this. Democratic uh, Colorado Governor Jared Polis accusing Colorado hospitals of this nonprofit uh, profiteering, if you will. Yeah, and Jared Polis is the governor in the state of the state of Colorado address back in 2019-2020 uh, cited our Open the Books report from 2019, when we took a look at the top 82 largest nonprofit hospitals that were making big profits. And so look, you know, Donald Trump came through with the healthcare price transparency rule, and to his credit, the Biden administration, they finalized that healthcare price transparency rule in 2021. So it's entirely non uh, nonpartisan. A third party audit organization called Patient Advocates Rights They've audited the hospitals, whether they're complying with healthcare uh, price transparency, and they found three quarters of the hospitals across the country are flouting it, they're ignoring it, they're not completely in compliance with the rule. Obviously, serious ethical concerns here, raising, I think, other questions. If they did this, how else might the hospital system uh, mislead the public? Well, certainly uh, when you have for every dime of congressional COVID aid that bailed out the hospitals and the hospitals were screaming that they needed the money. And for these 20 large nonprofits, it was $23 billion. So the American taxpayer is very generous with these quote unquote nonprofit hospital groups. For every dollar of COVID aid, there's been a $5 net net increase in their assets. After you subtract off all their liabilities, their expenses, all the money they owe, on a net net basis, their net worth jumped by $124 billion. For every dollar of COVID aid, their net worth jumped by $5. Adam Andrzejewski, thank you so much. Thank you. Tomorrow is the 24th annual World Falun Dafa Day. Practitioners and people around the globe celebrate the spiritual discipline that teaches the universal values of truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. To find out why people are so passionate about the practice, NTD's Melina Wisecup takes us to the celebration at the Ellipse, the public section of the lawn just south of the White House. These spiritual practitioners are gathered here in the heart of Washington, D.C. They tell me why today is a day worth celebrating. My health has improved. Um, I've become much more confident and poised. Because I was able to ask so many questions in life before Falun Gong, and most of those questions were answered. And focus, I have more focus. Having this celebration gives people awareness of Falun Gong, Falun Dafa. Practitioners in Canada, Peru, Ukraine, Germany, Sweden, Russia, Taiwan, and many other countries are celebrating the 31st anniversary of Falun Dafa's public introduction, which coincides with the 72nd birthday of the practice's founder, Mr. Li Hongzhu. And so it's also very much a, a chance to celebrate him and the contribution that he's made uh, to, to our lives, especially mine. But practitioners in China, where the practice originated, are oppressed. The Chinese Communist Party has persecuted the practice since 1999, trying to silence anyone who follows these universal and peaceful principles of truthfulness, compassion and tolerance. Those who met face to face with the CCP's brutal persecution tell me why it was worth it to not give up. After practicing Falun Dafa, I started to understand what we live for. I realized the true meaning of life. So I can't give it up. I hope the Chinese Communist Party will realize they've committed the biggest mistake. They have mislabeled good people. The five meditative exercises in the practice's core values are universally embraced by people from all walks of life. 
and even the young ones tell me they feel the energy that's emanated. I'm like at the beach by myself hearing the water. I think about like how I can reflect on things and how I can make things better. Onlookers who aren't practicing also tell us they can feel the uplifting energy. It's very calming, pretty peaceful. It really calms you that you, there are people who are making voices for these kinds of initiative. And keeping this voice is exactly what this group of practitioners aims to do, even in the face of persecution by the Chinese regime. They plan to celebrate many more World Falun Dafa Days for years to come. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. Thank you for watching the Capitol Report. If you want to see our full broadcast, check us out at epochtv.com.